Hi and welcome to Architects Not Architecture. One month has passed since our last event and we are happy to welcome you back. Today we are hosting a new edition of our virtual world tour. And seeing what is happening in Ukraine, it is hard for us to focus on seeking inspiration and joyful moments. We are shocked against war and worried about the integrity of human rights. We have decided to continue with it as culture lifts our spirits, which is so important in dark days. Our colleague Elisabetta will introduce the event and I will meet you and the speakers for the interviews and roundtable discussion. Hi, nice to welcome you to today's event. This evening, we are virtually landing in Canada and we are thrilled to have with us two of the most relevant Canadian architects, Brigitte Shim, co-founder of Shim Southcliffe Architects, and Johanna Herm, co-founder of 5468796 Architecture. This event is part of our current virtual world tour. Our next stops will be China on March 23rd and Australia on April 28th, and we would love to see you there. And we actually have great news. Our in-person events will be back soon. We are working on events in and out with Europe and we will be announcing them very soon. The upcoming in-person event will be broadcasted as well, so that wherever you are, you will still be able to enjoy the talks of these inspiring architects. Make sure to follow us on social media like LinkedIn and Instagram to keep updated with the upcoming events. For those of you joining us for the first time, let us briefly introduce our format. At Architects Not Architecture, we do not focus on architectural projects, but on the individuals who designed and built them. We often know the projects and awards of renowned architects, but what we often miss out on are the people behind them. It is them and their unique personal history, which influence how they work and what they create. So we try to bring to the stage what too often remains unseen. Today, our speakers will talk about their career paths, their influences, and the experiences that shaped them and made them become who they are today. And the main rule is, they are not allowed to talk about their own projects. Going back to today's event, this event is kindly supported by our partner Vectorworks Canada. We would also like to mention our media partners, Azur, AIA Canada Society, the Ontario Association of Architects, Arc Daily, and Architizer. We are very excited about the next one and a half hours. The program will be the following. Each speaker will have 30 minutes on our virtual stage, 20 minutes for their presentation, followed by a 10 minutes interview. After the two talks, we will have a round of discussion where we will ask some of your questions. So make sure to get ready and use the box on our website to send in your questions. You will find it on our website when you scroll down. So this is the plan for today. Let's get started. Our first speaker was born in Helsinki. After studying at the Helsinki University of Technology, she returned to Winnipeg in 1996, where she previously had studied and completed a Bachelor of Environmental Design degree and a Master of Architecture degree at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. After working together at the Kohlmeyer Architecture, she and her university colleague, Sasha Radulovic, went out on their own in 2007 and founded 5468796 Architecture in Winnipeg, Canada. She has taught design at the University of Manitoba Toronto, Montreal, and in 2019, she was named Visiting Professor Morgenstern Chair at the College of Architecture IIT Chicago. She was awarded the Manitoba Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Emerging Business in 2010, and in 2017 was shortlisted for Architectural Reviews International Moira Gemil Prize for Women in Architecture. 546796 distinguish themselves with their design ambition and their entrepreneurial hustle and strives to address architectural and civic issues. We are greatly honored to have her with us on our virtual stage today. Welcome, Johanna Herm.
Hello, good afternoon, um, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining me. I am um, really uh, quite sort of uh, jittered by this presentation, but as I grew up in an environment where excessive talking or, or making uh, oneself the center of attention was generally frowned upon, uh, so this has made me particularly uncomfortable today, but of course, it's such a luxury and privilege to indulge in self-reflection. -re and um, as weird as the next 20 minutes are for me, I've also felt the real sense of duty to be honest and straightforward, especially um, to any of the students out there that might be listening. Um, I've been part of a few different realities and landscapes over the past 45 years, and uh, these contexts frame the main pieces of my story. Um, on the other hand, the influences and inspirations come in small pieces, uh, not as big revelations. And it's about people in the context mainly. And, and yes, of course, I look at other people's work and I'm inspired by it, but it's not ultimately what drives me, but rather this kind of messy patchwork of life um, that I'm about to share. I was born in 1975 in Helsinki, about eight months before Oliver Alto died and the same month that Helsinki hosted a high profile European security summit at Finlandia Hall. Uh, the Congress wing was just completed for the occasion. Uh, I was attended by 35 world leaders, included Soviet Union's uh, Brezhnev and uh, President Gerald Ford from the US. Both of my parents were post-war kids and first generation and their families to receive a high school and then university education. My uh, mom graduated from the Helsinki School of Economics as a charter accountant, and my dad has a degree in social economics. All my grandparents went through the war. Uh, both grandparents were fighting in the front lines, uh, trying to defend Finland against the USSR our border neighbor and uh, my fraternal grandpa um, on the left here was an air defense. Uh, all his platoon members were shot around him and he could never really speak about the war directly. My um, uh, mom's dad I was sent to basic training at 17, but he was saved by his poor eyesight as the army didn't want guys with glasses as tank operators. Uh, he was ordered up north instead where he was chasing out the Germans who were burning Lapland to the ground while retreating. Up north is where he met my grandma. And of course, while this all may seem remote, I've been privileged and lucky to have my grandparents around well into my 40s. And it's their experiences of stories that have really colored my worldview and something that I will always carry with me. My grandmas particularly were fierce. My maternal grandma, or mummy, as we say in Finnish, spent summers at their cottage in the middle of nowhere and, and sort of felt to be never afraid of anything. My dad's mom, Sada, mummy, comes from the far east of the country, just 30 kilometers from the Russian border. Um, she was born in a sauna like most Finns at the time were and moved into Helsinki after the war uh, and worked three jobs simultaneously. Uh, at 82, she received a Medal of Honor from the president of Finland for having rowed out to the lake in the middle of the storm at night um, and saved two teenage boys from drowning. Um, she also happened to be in Beijing during the Tiananmen Square protest or massacre in 1989 telling the American tourists to stop crying during their evacuation, that uh, they were getting out, that it was really nothing compared to going through a war. Anyway, so I lost all of, uh, or three of these amazing people within a year in 1970, or 2017, 18. Um, but something about all of my grandparents' ability to really deal with uh, true obstacles always grounds me into thinking that whatever I'm facing, it's, it's pretty minor. I have a big brother, uh, we're close in age, and I've always played together uh, with him on the yard, in the woods, one of my grandparents' cottages. He's the, he's the calm one and I'm the opposite. My mom introduced me to culture, books, music, and, and theater. And I remember singing out loud to Abba and Boney M's Rara Raspuchin in the Orange Kitchen, um, or Brown and Orange Kitchen in the late 70s. Uh, mom took us to the public library every couple of weeks to stock up on new books. and. Her favorite classical composer is Chopin, and she plays the piano and accordion and can communicate in eight different languages. Um, but she absolutely hates public speaking or being a center of attention and despises arrogance and people who brag. That's mom. My dad taught me to draw and build with my hands. Um, as a kid, I thought he could fix anything. He built us a sailboat at the cottage and, uh, and a digger at the sandbox. Um, he made us and all the kids in our building a skating rink in the winter. It took me skiing and ballet and judo and art class, but mostly he just really instilled me the sense of right and wrong. And he never seemed to back down if he thought something or someone was not treated right. 
And I'm just now becoming uh, to terms of how privileged and lucky I've been to be surrounded by love and security and how much that can prepare a kid to do anything. And that starting line is certainly not even for many and not by a long shot. Um, so my little family of four lived in the 60s suburb called Mullipuro, um, designed in the height of modernism uh, in Eastern Helsinki. Uh, like the majority of the people in the city, we lived in an apartment building and, and there was a real mix of incomes in the neighborhood. Social housing and low-income housing was intermingled with the full ownership apartment um, complexes. And growing up in this setting, um, I think has a lot to do with who I became and what I, what I believe. Um, Mulleboro is a pretty gritty place and school was rough at times. I got into fist fights and many times defending others against bullies, but I think in some ways I, I knew even then that I had agency and that um, came with some responsibility to defend the less fortunate. So I don't know if it's the environment, my grandma's interest in politics or my dad's disposition in life or a combination thereof, but it made me a bit of a crusader. And um, I always had this internal nag that there's a mission beyond traditional lane of architecture that is pretty urgent and that I have a duty to participate in. Um, growing up in a city without any tall buildings, I was super fascinated by the rather heroic water towers that mark, marked each of our suburbs. The Mulipur water tower is the largest and was designed in 1965. Uh, standing under it gave me shivers, I still remember that, and a real sense that that powerful structure has the capacity to really stir your insides. The other curious part about Helsinki and Mulipuro is the existence of these World War bunkers in the woods that were just outside of my schoolyard and played in them often. And that nuclear bomb shelters were pretty much everywhere below our feet. Um, the US-Soviet relationship was pretty poor in the beginning of the 80s and the possibility of nuclear altercation was real. And I guess that's particularly topical right now. Um, Mulipuro bomb shelter was completed in 1974 and it houses about 7,000 people. And somehow we lived with the reality of all of this through my otherwise pretty happy and carefree, carefree childhood. In 1986, the Chernobyl reactor blew in near Kiev and our forests were covered in this invisible killer. I remember when we were told not to eat the berries in the forest and when you couldn't pick mushrooms at the, at the cottage. But these memories, good and bad, are strongly linked with the space and atmosphere. And I think that has to do with some of the early associations, um, mom sometimes gave me her tape player before bed and I would listen to cassettes with Frigg or Sibelius drifting off to sleep. My best friend also named Johanna lived uh, next door to us on the third floor of our apartment building and off the same stairwell. And sometimes we sat hours chatting in the stair landing uh, to which both apartments open up to. On weekend mornings, I went over to her place for sleepovers and her dad would play Murskul Maya by a Finnish composer, Lasse Mortensen, um, on the piano to wake us up. And the music is still so wondrous to me um, and takes me right back to that room. I can see the furniture and I can hear the funny crunch that their guest mattress made on the floor. Similarly, the best place in the world for a kid, Lina Mackey, Helsinki's permanent amusement park, has this legendary wooden roller coaster with the smell of tar. And every time I walk by a railway line with the same scent, I'm right back in that roller coaster and it's just magical. I remember big events by their spaces that I was in when they happened. And I'm, I'm sure this is common, but um, something about that is that always makes me think and ask how a space and architecture feels, what's the mood, the psyche of the place. And I, I dream of working uh, or doing work like Bridget does. <laughs> Uh, one day where you can really conjure people's primal sensibilities through light and sound and, and a texture and, and even smell. I also think though that my identity is definitely colored by growing up in a small nation and, and essentially being pulled out of that con context then as a teen and teenager or young adult, always feeling this other, <laughs> this sense of otherness um, an outsider looking in wherever I go since that time, um, increasingly as, as a tourist visiting Helsinki, even though it's so familiar, but on the other hand, never feeling fully Canadian either. So I can't bring myself to really cheer for Canada in sporting competitions, but I will still literally cheer up when Finland wins goal at the Olympics. So I'm not sure what that is, but something about the underdogs, the surviving of the USSR takeovers, sort of being a small nation that can. 
Uh, the other value that I have carried with me from the homeland is, of course, the public appreciation of architecture. And what's indicative of that difference to me is, is that before Euro in my formative years, Alto was, was on the 50 mark bill, not the political figure or president, and, and everyone who knew who he was. Architecture was uh, regularly featured in the daily newspaper and, and design in general with Maramek Guanitalas of the like was built into as a cultural value which I found very different in my experience in Canada. The quality of light on the 60th parallel and beyond is also really precious. On the one hand, uh, we're the light of uh, the land of the midnight sun with 30% of Finland sitting above the Arctic Circle. But on the other hand, the winter in the winter, the sunlight hours are super, super short. Um, and majority of the Finns, 90% of us, I think, are, uh, or something are Lutheran, uh, mostly very secular, but as a school kid, I would, I would always, or we would uh, attend Lutheran church as, a, as part of the curriculum. And, and there's something about the austerity of that space that I really associate with peace and beauty. And I think reducing things to their basic element has been baked into me from early on. I never lived in a house in Finland and the common spaces between buildings were shared. And, and that's where seniors would sit and kids would play and where you made friends for life. Um, in the language, you, you say that you're from the yard as opposed to from the building. And it, it's me, it's very indicative of where the value is being placed. And after about five years in our practice, I realized that we had been sort of instinctually um, designing shared a public outdoor space into every housing project that we had been commissioned to do, even though it wasn't in the brief. By comparison, on the right in the picture is my first place uh, that I lived in in Winnipeg and the in-between is filled with a parking lot and a garbage can. So those yards of my childhood are largely missing in the North American context. And as a practice, we've began to believe that they are absolutely critical for multifamily housing to become a more acceptable model for living in, um, in this continent. I knew earlier on that I definitely didn't wanna do what my mom or dad did for living. And I knew I had to to be creative work and design and architecture was something that I really admired. At four or five here, I decided that I should collect all the red things in the house um, or apartment into a display. At around 12, I vividly remember seeing Saha's winning competition for the peak in Hong Kong featured in the Helsingin Sanom at the local newspaper. I really thought I understood what architecture was supposed to accomplish um, at that moment and realized that I really could be an architect. For high school, I decided to apply for what, uh, what would have been considered an Ivy League high school in the center of Helsinki, Vesu Lukio. Um, I got in and I took the Metro daily to get to, uh, to downtown for school. And the cultural shift in that was pretty significant for me. All of a sudden I was surrounded with people that came from means and, and there was a real weight in culture and art. I remember having a bit of an identity crisis in the beginning and not feeling like I belonged. Um, but then I also had a real aha moment in art class where I was practicing the, for the university's architecture department entrance exams. And the task was to imagine yourself in a matchbox looking up and having to draw what you see. And I think this was really where I started to think about scale. During my junior high school, I also, um, I read Api Turenti by Harry Sirola and the, and the pain of the creative process, feeling exposed by putting yourself and your beliefs on the line was really impactful. And I still think about that book sometimes when I feel trepidation about something um, in design that feels very personal. I also got into Mika Valtari, the dark angel, the Egyptian, and how he was able to transport the reader into the place through a narrative that's so detailed and atmospheric. And I often think about architecture in a similar way, that every detail tells a story, and that again, that every place has a psyche and a mood um, as something that I search to tap into. Then fast forward to 1993, when I was selected by a rural farming family in Manitoba to um, be their exchange student for the year. All I did at the other end was to sign up to go to Canada. So I landed in the prairies and the place of end endless wheat fields and expansive sky. Uh, and my Canadian family was lovely and, and still is, of course. Um, I got to drive the tractor and I learned that social life in small town really concentrates at the hockey rink and, and uh, uh, curling hall. I also met a Canadian farm boy who became my significant other for the next 20 years. During that year, I became aware of my um, relationship to landscape, which had never sort of occurred to me before. And what I perceived as a lack of landscape in, in, in the prairies 
like all of a sudden it sort of didn't really exist and everything felt empty. Um, toward the end of that year, my family took a road trip to the next province uh, where Bridget's from, off the prairies and into the Canadian Shield. And as we got into the pine trees and the rock outcroppings, I had this really strong physical and emotional reaction to seeing the landscape that I felt uh, at home in. Uh, it took me years to understand and appreciate the prairie landscape and its beauty. At the university, I was mostly educated by men, like probably true for a majority of my colleagues of this vintage and older. Um, I owe a great deal to Herb Enns, Ed Epp, Jason Chong, who challenged me in all kinds of ways in those formative years, um, of course, and now have become colleagues and friends and sounding boards and, and cheerleaders for us. Um, so, um, Karen Nelson, though, uh, left a particular um, impact on me through the travel studio we did in Italy, and I I felt like for the first time I could find the beginnings of what I thought was my own voice um, in design and architecture. Uh, I think it was the hands on sketching and he sort of took the time to debate the merits of what I was doing almost as if we were equals. So I really miss Carl. Um, in Italy 98, I also connected with the classmate of, uh, and one of my very best friends to date, Kate Young, now Thompson, and the current CEO of Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. Uh, we were roommates on the trip and now make pe people feel uncomfortable in official situations by call telling them that we slept together. Um, that's a joke. But um, she said to me that at some point on the trip in passing that no one likes a whiner. And somehow that really struck a chord and uh, had me turn my sort of natural Finnish pessimism into a more cynical optimism. Um, during the mid 90s, the Super Dutch, OMA, MVRDV uh, was what everyone looked up to. Uh, SML, XL had just come out. And I tried to read Delirious New York and understood none of it. Um, I was too scared to admit it at the time, but it sort of registered pretty high on my BS radar. And I, I couldn't understand why architects were unwilling to speak directly or really say what they mean. Um, and I felt a bit dismayed that it seemed like you could simply copy a cool house project in your studio and, and get an A. I wrote, pro I wrote probably 10 essays for different purposes about Stephen Hall's Chiasma, which at the time was under construction in Helsinki. And I, I followed with a great interest the public debate um, in the local papers, uh, in many ways, the rejection of foreign architecture in Finland and taking on some of that rejection myself. After Italy, I went back to Helsinki and I attended the Alta University for a term. Um, I took uh, housing um, led, led by Teemu Kurkela from JMKK, one of the now best known Finnish practices. And after having been at the U of M where the conceptual grounding was really heavily emphasized, I was entirely lost at the sort of direct formalism that seemed to be the prevailing um, in the school and generally on Finnish architecture. And I felt this strong sense of otherness again, couldn't quite settle in myself the lack of narrative. Um, but on the other hand, it also made me uh, question the need for complexity. And I started to believe uh, boiling things down to their essence and, and trusting the spatial capacity of architecture to deliver experiences that can move people. The other professor from Helsinki, I remember fondly, is uh, Kisik, um, who has been kind enough to keep in touch. Um, he's emailed to me in the late uh, 2017 where he sort of casually called me the most internationally well-known Finnish architect, which isn't true, of course, uh, meant the world to me in a sense that I finally felt somewhat accepted as this weird sort of half breed that I felt that I was. Um, uh, and the farm boy, Glenn and I got married in 2001. Um, at this point, he not only came with me to Winnipeg so I could attend university, but also enrolled him in law school from which he graduated successfully in the same year as I finished my master's. He too came from very little and I put himself through, uh, through school by driving a garbage truck in our early mornings and weekends. And, and um, we grew apart and separated in 2014, but I'm still so very proud of him and his humility and uncompromising honesty. That's definitely kind of shaped me uh, through the years. By far the biggest impact on me as an architect though has been meeting Sasha, my business and now life partner. Uh, we started doing student competitions together in undergrad. Um, Sasha came to our class in second year as a war refugee from the former Yugoslavia. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure this is appropriate, but I paired him here with the Yugoslavian war memorials um, that to me embody his energy while containing some of the scars from his past that he willfully ignores. Um, he had already completed four to five years of architecture 
school in Sarajevo in Belgrade and he was way ahead of the rest of us and he managed to work full time while attending school. Something that just put me at all of his capacity to produce. I got invited to Sasha's competition group simply because I made meticulous models. Uh, we ended up doing studio work together uh, too and soon enough we were called the group of four. That's Sasha and myself, uh, Bill or William Galloway, now a professor at the University of Tokyo and Anthony Yosipovic. Um, but after graduating from university in um, 2001, I also convinced Glenn that we really should see the world. So we sold everything we had. We saved money and scraped together 25K, a lot of that from his garbage job and set out to backpack around the world for eight months. Um, it was amazing. And, and whether it was sleeping with rats in the Malaysian jungle or walking the Great Wall of China, traveling on a shoestring, I think, um, really allows you to see people and the, and the things that make us universally happy. After returning to Winnipeg, Sasha convinced his then boss, Stephen Kohlmeyer, to hire me. Um, I learned a lot from Steve, but also from Jim Wagner, a senior architect at the firm. And I'm forever grateful for their guidance and insights. Um, mostly though, the five years that spent at Kohlmeyer solidified Sasha's and my design partnership. And it's definitely clear to me that I would be a completely different, uh, I would be in a completely different place today if it wasn't for his talent, his, his boundless energy, his disobedience, if you will, and uh, uncompromising interest and drive to explore architecture and re-see it every time we take on a new project. He's a junkie of architecture and he's my reference library to all current work around the world. Together, we've admired RCR's, uh, you know, quiet power and the weight of their work for, for years before Pritzker and similarly, it's Million Radich's work um, that embodies some of those qualities, but at the same time, is sort of wonderfully weird and brave. Uh, in 2007, we made what felt like a risky decision to go on our own and started 546. Um, and through that time, I've been influenced by every person that has been part of our group for any significant time, especially our other partner, Colin. Uh, in the back center there. Uh, and of course, the work that we do, which in many ways has shaped us more than the other way around. I think about other influences in the visual arts, there's definitely something about the mood and the psyche of Powers Maggie films that I've always felt akin to, something about the fascination with the pathetic or the, or the fringe, but also this basic humanism and ability to laugh at the absurd, uh, absurd and, and, and at oneself. The similar to the work of Winnipeg Collaborative Lodge, um, where the protagonist is the common folk, the misunderstood, and the, something about that fits with us working in the margins of architecture in Winnipeg and um, with the most banal, but also I feel the most important work in multifamily housing that touched the lives of ordinary people. So it's this stuff that keeps me, uh, me finding meaning today. Um, it's sort of the hopeful cynicism that's also clever in being not or more or not more or less than it needs to be. Um, in addition to that, just a couple more slides. I've been lucky to see and travel a lot over the past 15 years, and it's been a network of people I've met and learned from over the years that sort of continue to build our understanding of architecture out there. Um, getting that pit in your stomach when you see your colleagues or the stars of architecture out there doing amazing work is what really kind of drives us to try harder. And I've had some amazing Amazing mentors and, and critics and role models over the years, like uh, clients like Jeff Badger that have schooled us in understanding the economics of architecture, Phyllis Lambert, the Joan of Arc, who's certainly not afraid to say if our work doesn't measure up, or Uncle Ron Keenberg, who keeps tab on us from a distance. Kai Uwe has always been willing to share advice, or Jan Giel, who've been, who we've been fortunate enough to learn from over the years. And, in all of it, um, it's the human thread that's at the center of architecture that that holds my attention. And finally, my uh, latest and, and biggest impact and inspiration arrived in 2020 by Cesarian. Um, he makes me worry about the future differently and is by far Sasha's and my best project together. He also makes me um, finally understand and appreciate my mom fully um, and the power of love uh, as the beginning of all good things in life. Thank you. Wow, uh, such a beautiful presentation, Johanna. Thank you a lot. We really appreciate it. Um, and of course, I had to think uh, back of uh, the, your second slide with a small talk in Finnish, where you can try to avoid saying anything at all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, how, do you, how are you feeling now? 
oh, I, I'm relieved. I'm, I'm just really looking forward to Bridget's presentation now that I can actually fully concentrate. So it's good. Um, it's so beautiful. So many things um, that, that uh, had an impact on you are, are common things also for other people like traveling. Uh, you mentioned, for example, expending 20, so uh, selling everything that you had and going for how many months traveling? Can you tell us eight, a bit more? Eight months, yeah. And uh, expending how much? What is the budget? So in case we want to do something similar. so <laughs> It was 25,000 that we somehow scraped together. I, I don't, um, I credit that lot to Glenn, my ex. Um, he worked diligently in that garbage job to, to make a lot of it happen. So yeah, there you go. It was mm. worth it for sure. Mm. Well, that must be uh, super nice, but so many insightful and uh, so many nice uh, topics. Uh, this one thing that uh, I kind of expected you to talk about, and it's about shoes. <laughs> um, you have a passion for shoes, right? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, that they say, they tell the world a bit more about what you care, and they also have presiding conversations. Can you tell us a bit more about yeah, well, I had a slide where it was about sort of the fashion icons out there and the things I admire, but I didn't fit in. And um, but I guess it's something that I I really goes back to urbanism and I what I when I think about the kind of um, crazy amounts of of money and and resources and expenditure that we spend on on cars and that kind of mobility around cities and how harmful that is to the to the environment and so this is sort of the lesser of the two evils that allows me to indulge in my little um i guess passion or 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 whatever that's also sort of communicates the value of, of good vibrant walkable cities so mm -hmm. i don't know how else to, to to frame that but i just really love shoes and and like you said they're conversation starters somehow so yeah so hopefully if uh, for an upcoming in-person event, if we are lucky to have you as a speaker, um, we will you go see some of them. Um, and I was aware that th that that passion also cost you some, uh, at least an, an incident. Um, oh yes. And I, and I wanted to ask you, how do you deal with criticism in general, not regarding shoes, but in general? Um, well, sometimes it's hard, of course, like when I, when I'm talking about this sort of personal investment, but you feel like you're, you're putting yourself, um, out on the line and architecture is personal in that way. So it's, it's tough to separate that from who you are and, and just sort of see it as, as, as the work that's, uh, that's not a personal attack, but it, it I mean, I, I think we're so people in this profession are passionate about, um, it so much that, um, yeah, it, it, it you, you take it to heart and, and you kind of um, look in and you try to do better next time. I don't, I don't know what else to really say about it. Um, but yeah, looking in the mirror, trying to learn from it, I guess that's mm. what you can do with criticism. But I'm glad we have critics because I've certainly learned a lot that way. Uh, you don't always get things right in the first go. Uh, as a kid, you were inspired. You mentioned Saha Hadid as part of your inspiration. Um, years later, uh, you have been Manitoba Woman of the Year, Chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, uh, and many other leading positions. With uh, what influence would you like to be in other women, in other women? Well, I don't know. I guess um, uh, God, I wasn't expecting these questions. I, I I guess I would like to be an architect. Ultimately, is what it is, um, and just not being considered woman architect that's ultimately i guess the prize but um i do think that um obviously being international women's day yesterday that we still need those sorts of things today because it's it's still not we're not quite there yet where it's just as easy that lots of um sort of situations in my past too even with being very privileged as i am um where i wasn't considered equal i wasn't spoken to like like the men in the room and so on. So I, I hope that, you know, in some ways, whatever I'm doing uh, will we'll make it so that the next generation doesn't have to deal mm -hmm. with that stuff. What are the biggest challenges that you are faced uh, or that you have faced as a leading architect? Um, well, I think any challenges that, that other architects would, would face. Um, so, 
when things that you're really invested into um, are on the chopping block because something that you have no control over went, went uh, astray in a project and then having to kind of carve your way back from there and trying to save the quality of, of the work. Um, so that's definitely it. And then feeling powerless, I think in a lot of cases where we think what we're doing makes a big impact on, um, you know, trying to de build denser cities and vibrant cities and, and more compact form and, and convince people to live in less because of the environmental crisis we're in, because the housing crisis we're in, and then not having the political will in our, in our cities, in our country to, um, to make those changes that would seem like the obvious choices that we could make. And so that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the toughest. Actually, good to mention that you mentioned quality because uh, I have a quote that uh, you, your father always said, or at least that you, I watched it in another interview, um, regarding the importance on, of design and, the, and quality. And you say, uh, he always said that poor people cannot afford to buy cheap things, right? That's right. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. What, do, what does good design mean to you? Uh, well, I guess it means that in part that good design is something that lasts a little bit longer and that you invest in it and that investment is worthwhile and it's, it's going to produce better, better ROI in the, or return on investment in the long term, right? Um, I think that's what it means and that we value the things that are around us as opposed to, you know, living disposably. Um, but then, of course, saying that I can, I, I can understand that that's not the priority in, in many cases where we don't have the means and uh, where people are in, are really struggling. So, but I, but I guess we're hoping that more, more people could be touched by design and architecture because they do have such an impact on our daily experience and, and the way we feel and, and basic human health and happiness. So. Mm. Um, re actually regarding the uh, so good design and quality, um, it must be kind of something that you were very aware of uh, coming from Finland as a, uh, Scandinavian design is well known for the for the quality. Um, I wonder how do you think it's um, it is important to educate people about the importance of quality on good design when uh, the number one priority is often cost. So how could we? Uh, you just mentioned also the uh, the topic to cost. Um, but also there's a balance between cost and good design and quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it doesn't necessarily have to cost more to do good design. And that's always something that we've believed in. Um, it can cost a, a same and it can be better or it can be, mm -hmm. it can, you know, so it, it quality isn't necessarily mutually exclusive of, of, of that, um, of that cost. And, and I guess that's the mantra that we, we try to operate under. And I, I, fully subscribe to but it is tough because there's so little room uh, at least in the private development sector where we've been uh, working for the past 15 years to wiggle when the profit is the is the driver so you have to find that that space where you can carve architecture out of mm. it's nice to uh, to hear uh, through your presentation that you were always in fights defending other people and de defending for what you think it's good and the kind of you kind of, of uh, doing the same with architecture and um, positioning yourself for, for good design and what will be better for, for cities. So it's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I often think that life would be certainly easier if I didn't get into those arguments with politicians and that other things. But I, I do think that we need more people in design to be in politics and and in mm. the boardrooms where decisions are being made and where money is being spent. So uh, that's a really key part of uh, what I think is the realm of architecture these days, that it's much deeper and much wider than a, that sort of traditional lane. And um, I guess we try to engage in it. And I, I hope um, to inspire my students and others in the, in the next generation to do even more. Very nice. Thank you, Johanna, for your presentation and thank you for the for the uh, for your time. Let's catch up later during the roundtable discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you. We'll go now thank with you. Bridget. Now, before we start with our second speaker, we would like you to do something. Grab your phone, 
unlock it, go to Instagram and type architects not architecture without spaces or simply scan this code with your phone camera. Found it? Now press follow. As you can see on our profile, you can find not only event announcements, but also event highlights. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. For those of you who don't use Instagram, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Thank you for supporting us. Our second speaker was born in Kingston, Jamaica. She graduated at the University of Waterloo, where she earned degrees in environmental studies and architecture. She worked with Arthur Erickson and Associates and with Bert Samson Architects. And she concurrently started teaching at the University of Toronto in 1988, where she currently is a tenured professor. She taught at various universities, such as École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland, Harvard and Yale. In 1994, she, along with her partner Howard Sutcliffe, founded her Toronto-based practice, Shim Sutcliffe Architects. She highly values the interlocking of architecture and nature and tries to ensure that the architecture fits its circumstances. Her work has garnered awards such as over a dozen Governor General's Medal for Architecture, as well as an American Institute of Architects National Honor Award. In 2021, Shim Southcliffe received the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Gold Medal in recognition for their long-lasting and pivotal contribution to architecture in Canada. We are thankful to have her today with us. Welcome, Bridget Shim. Okay. Um, first of all, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I always look into the future, and Fairman and ANA has challenged me to look backward. <laughs> uh, this has been a very difficult task, but I am grateful for his kind invitation that has forced me to look into the rear view mirror. Uh, my ancestors came from China. The Hakka Chinese are known as the Han Chinese, and they created these amazing tulus, which are these multi-generational fortified round houses, mostly located in the Fujian mountain area of Southern China. This is a photo at the bottom of my mother's family village, which is now on the outskirts of Shenzhen, which has transformed in really only two decades into a city of over 20 million people. In 2017, we returned to a family gathering in the upper left, and you can see that it's all about the food. Uh, my grandparents migrated from Southern China to Jamaica in the 1930s. So both my parents and my siblings and I were all born in Kingston, Jamaica. Many of the Hakka Chinese were shopkeepers. The photo on the right is from my cousin Jeanette and that shows her parents working in my mother's family store, which is shown on the lower right, uh, uh, lower left. This is a photo of my brother, my sister and I departing from Jamaica for Toronto. And when I arrived in my grade one class, all of my classmates were very impressed that I came from Jamaica because it was a seven letter word. A week later, another student arrived from Saskatchewan and everyone was even more impressed because it was a 12 letter word and seemed even more exotic than Jamaica. A few days later, a February blizzard hit Toronto and I caught my very first glimpse of snow. The dull urban fabric magically transformed into a winter wonderland overnight. My first snow angel has long since melted, but the truly extraordinary experience of being enveloped by these teeny tiny snowflakes, which multiplied and had the capacity to create mountain ranges uh, was really so special. And experiencing snow for the very first time as a child has left an indelible mark and has somehow connected to my deep respect for and appreciation of our remarkable Canadian landscape. Two years after our family arrived in Canada, we traveled to Montreal and embraced Expo 67. Montreal and Canada welcomed the world. We rode the monorails and the Buckminster Fuller Dome, which housed the US Pavilion. We marveled at Musha Safdie's habitat and architecture was the star of this world's fair. And it also left an indelible mark on me. 
my parents, Aston and Shirley, were really amazing and loving parents who were, I would describe now looking back as fearless newcomers who never looked backward and only looked forward at their new home in Canada. Each summer we would visit Canada's national parks from coast to coast, giving us such a tactile understanding of the vastness of our new home, the majesty and true beauty of the Canadian landscape. I graduated from the University of Waterloo's architecture program, which was housed in an industrial building off campus. It was often common to see my classmates using the studios to do quick oil change on their cars, uh, interior bicycle races. And my first year, Peter Cook shared his inflatable pigs and it truly expanded my definition of what architecture was. In this uh, photo, um, I, I was a co-op work student and ended up in Arthur Erickson's office in Vancouver. In the upper uh, left image is a view of Cornelia Oberlander, the landscape architect, the remarkable Phyllis Lambert, the founder of the Canadian Centre for Architecture, and on the right, Arthur Erickson. So as a student working in Arthur Erickson's Laurel Street office in Vancouver in the early 80s, it was a truly amazing experience. Working under this forest of tree columns, I had never been in an office with other female architects who were leading teams and realizing really impressive projects. I spent time at Robson Square, which was a collaboration of architecture and landscape between uh, Arthur and Cornelia. And I learned how nature could be incorporated into a dense urban setting. In the image on the lower left, I was able to visit many of Arthur's West Coast houses, learning from uh, about the fusion of architecture and site. I was always interested in the issue of serendipity and how chance encounters changes the course of your life. I was fortunate to meet my talented and gifted partner in work and life, Howard Sutcliffe. We met in architecture school building models and it's been truly a life journey learning about life and architecture together. This is a view at Ronchamp uh, quite some time ago. As a recent graduate, I was working in Toronto for George Baird, and I witnessed the demolition of something called the Bull of a Tower in the upper left. A group of young architects uh, decided to work together and we all created awareness about Toronto's modern architecture. Uh, so there were about five of us and we mounted an exhibition in the rotunda of Vio Ravel's modern Toronto City Hall. We held a, a symposium hosted by journalist Barbara Frum, who said it was easier to love your grandparents than your parents. And that sharing, uh, that, and sharing her view that the modern movement may be too close for us to really appreciate during the mid 80s in Toronto. So we did an exhibition, a catalog, and really worked so hard to create a, an awareness of this vital period in Toronto's history. And you can see the spread of the city hall as one of the pages of the catalog. As young architects, Howard and I were interested in the relationship between modernism and nature. And we were very fortunate to receive a Canada Council grant and it enabled us to travel to Scandinavia in the early 90s. So we're coming back to Johanna's uh, home. Uh, we visited the work of Albert Alto, Sigurd Leveren, Sver Fenn, and many, many others. And seeing work firsthand uh, in its actual context was so informative. And I would say this left a really indelible mark on both of us. We were also fortunate to return to Scandinavia several times. In 2003, we were part of an architecture delegation traveling with our Governor General Adrian Clarkson to Finland and Iceland. So Howard and I spent two weeks traveling with Arthur Erickson and Jill Saussier from Montreal. Uh, for me, it was so special to kind of having worked in Arthur's office as a kind of student to have spent two weeks looking at buildings. Uh, so the image in the middle is a view of Arthur in the Rovignami Library by Albert Alto uh, in October. And just to kind of spend all this time together viewing architecture was so special. In 2006, we returned again to Finland as speakers of the Alto Symposium and actually got to experience many of the buildings that we were there as kind of a uh, tourist and we were invited into places like Villa Maria and had dinner there. And so such meaningful and special experiences inhabiting these really um, iconic pieces of architecture. 
Uh, from our first project, we've always been making, experimenting and testing ideas. On the left is a view of Howard flame cutting a ton and a half of rusting steel. And on the right is a view of the same project three decades later. So we're always trying to design good ruins. And if it's a good ruin, there might be a chance that it could be a good building. In Toronto, we're a Great Lakes city located in the center of North America. And winter is a very long season. And maybe it was my journey from sunny Jamaica to Toronto, but there's a reason that I have such a deep respect and love for winter. We've always been surrounded and impacted by artists. This is a photo by artist Thaddeus Halonia, who is from uh, New Brunswick, capturing snow. Uh, the artist Tony Sherman in the upper uh, painted in encaustic, and we shared a studio space with Tony for many years. Michael Awad in the lower left was a former student who also worked in our studio. He built a specialized camera, enabling him to take long pan shots to capture the urban environment. Uh, Margaret Priest, a, a gifted artist, has visited our work through her amazing graphite drawings, enabling us to see new aspects of our own projects. Ed Bertinsky, this is an early photograph of Rock of Ages, a Vermont quarry. And on the right is a construction photograph that Ed took of our Integral House project. So really this kind of long relationship with many artists. Adam Agoyan is a friend and a client and also an inspiration because his work oscillates between place and placelessness, teaching us so many lessons. I also have been committed to educating the next generation of architects. I've taught for three decades. Um, and I really feel like when I teach a studio, my students aren't just doing an exercise, but I really take every studio as an opportunity to reimagine the future of our cities. Um, I love site visits. So here's a view of us at the Hoover Dam and Robert Smith's spiral jetty, and really being in the landscape and understanding projects firsthand by experiencing them. Uh, in the early 90s, we found a derelict lot in a back alley with six abandoned cars. We went through a complicated process and built the only home that our two kids have ever known. By actually after building our own home, I set about researching the evolution and potential of laneways with my architecture, landscape architecture and urban design students at the University of Toronto. And I've really been advocating for laneways, not, as, not only as a place for diverse housing, but as a new public realm in our city. So the kind of incremental becomes a larger project through a kind of uh, collaboration. As architects, we live in Toronto at 43 degrees latitude in a seasonal climate. As architects, we want to paint with light. The left is a study model and we do lots of them. And on the right is a winter view of one of our spaces. And this kind of low winter light is so special and really something that we always try to capture and somehow manipulate and enhance and really embed in our work. We also love winter water as a way to register the invisible, the subtle shifts of temperature from a water to ice to steam to mist things that are often imperceivable actually become visible. We also love to work at the scale of furniture, thinking about materiality, how things come together, and again, places for human inhabitation. Uh, we love experimenting at the scale of hardware, fittings, fixtures, and we really believe that they contribute to the creation of rich spatial experiences. Um, this is our firefly lamp, really inspired by things you do as a kid at your summer cottage in the Canadian landscape. So we're combining a Pyrex lab glass with stainless steel mesh. And we really created these organic shaped resin pieces, but we embedded them with a phosphorescent powder that fishermen use. So the light glows uh, like the bioluminescence of fireflies. And we're always striving to create this kind of sense of wonder and delight. Uh, we've always been interested in this powerful dynamic between uh, nature and culture. And in a way, this kind of idea of viewing nature, which is the image on the left, but also somehow embedding nature into the work in different ways. And this kind of water jet cut metal leaf pattern of a black locust 
where the only color is really emanating from the autumn leaves in the, in the Toronto ravine landscape. And I just wanted to end with uh, uh, my final slide. Um, so as architects, we live and work in Toronto and, and really um, Phyllis Lambert uh, celebrated a few years ago, her 90th birthday. And she really left a charge saying, uh, you must put up a building which expresses the best of the society in which you live. And I feel like it's such a kind of fitting closure. She's such a iconic uh, individual who's left such a, a indelible mark on all of us. And I feel that as architects, that's really what we have to be trying to do every single day. So it's been a pleasure and thank you so much. Thank you for the nice presentation. It is so nice um, to get to know you from this perspective. Uh, we really enjoy it. Um, Brigitte, of all that you have achieved, uh, what are you the most proud of? Oh, I have two, uh, two children, uh, two boys uh, who are kind of in their 20s and doing wonderful things. So uh, it's, uh, being a parent is quite a challenge. Uh, working and being a parent is also equally challenging. And uh, I feel like uh, for us, that's been a kind of anchor and a core. Um, we've actually, um, I have not been very good at having a life work balance and separating uh, my work from my family life. So we've taken our kids everywhere with us. So they've traveled the world and we just figure we just mush it all together and somehow it all works. So nice. And they continue traveling, right? Uh, as at least one of them is uh, abroad studying. Yes, uh, one of them is studying in, uh, at uh, an art school in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And um, do you still have some uh, connection with uh, South Asia or Jamaica? Uh, so uh, through my cousin, who's a documentary filmmaker, uh, we've actually visited southern China recently with my, my, all my kids, my sister, my niece, um, and actually visited my mother, my father, and my grandmother's uh, ancestral home, uh, which was really meaningful for us. Um, mm. and, uh, uh, but, you know, it's a kind of, um, as time goes on, um, time passes, right? And so some of these villages, which were really separate villages are now have now been subsumed by this 20 million city of Shenzhen. So the buildings still remain, but they're embedded within and encrusted in this kind of mega city. Wow, well, yeah, that must be so different. Mm -hmm. um, also, you and your partner, uh, you both were awarded with very well-known prizes and meaningful prizes as uh, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Order of Canada. Last year, you received the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada Gold Medal. Those are huge achievements. Uh, what do awards mean to you? I would say um, we accept them with a lot of humility and the fact that they come from our peers uh, really matters. So, the, so, so anything where it's your peers acknowledging your work, I feel is uh, super meaningful for us. Um, uh, a lot of the work we do is actually not very big in scale in the big, like in terms of square footage or dollar value. And so I feel like um, design really has to count and it really has to matter. And uh, so I feel like we're really grateful to kind of uh, have uh, uh, received, uh, you know, the kind of acknowledgement from our mm -hmm. proud architect peer group. Actually, uh, how many people is uh, working at the office? How big is the, is the team? Uh, we have about eight people now, including Howard and I. So uh, we've always kept our studio small. Um, partly we never, neither uh, Howard and I really like managing other people. Uh, we don't really like doing interviews or competitions. Uh, so we just like to focus on projects and building work. So I think that's been our kind of uh, preoccupation. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder you partially have answered this uh, following question, but uh, as you just mentioned, um, you say that not, not interested in the office being a big practice in terms of numbers of number of people. Uh, in your opinion, what stage 
should a practice achieve to be at the highest moment of an architectural career? I think, so you're saying what, 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 sorry. What, just, what a practice should achieve, uh, should reach in order to be at the peak of the uh, architectural career, in your opinion? I guess I would say every practice is your biggest design project, <laughs> other than your kids and your family. I think it's kind of a, it's a design, it's a design process. And I feel like you have to really assess what you want to achieve out of your practice. So for us, scale never really mattered. And it was really about mm. the quality of the work. Um, and I guess we always felt that through doing um, the best work we could possibly do, um, it could actually uh, really be, um, have an impact just through the quality of the work and maybe not hit how, how big or how much money it was spent, but just the kind of issues of ideas that were embedded in it. Mm. You also mentioned during your presentation the, uh, the three decades that you have been teaching. Um, what is the main lesson that you want your students to take with them? So I would say that the work they do in architecture school is not just a nice little exercise, but I would say it has the capacity to reshape the future of our cities. And the mm -hmm. ideas that are incubated and are part of a kind of laboratory in school can actually be the future of how we build and what we think about in terms of what our built environment is all about. So the idea that, you know, we did a Laneway studio in 2003, which is so long ago, but it was really a kind of way of testing ideas about uh, this leftover invisible system as being a viable part of our public realm. And I would say it's taken 20 years, but I think it's kind of getting there and it's still a work in progress. But I feel that um, the fact that students can experiment in school and test ideas is just so, so important to the future of architecture, the future of society. Uh, and uh, I think that it's so um, critical to kind of be part of that conversation. Mm. And so it's interesting that uh, um, both of you, Johanna and you, you uh, had env environmental studies, uh, right? And it's something uh, 20 or 40 years ago, though not, not that uh, normal. Uh, we see that in the, uh, in the architectural schools today. But um, I guess that there was, there was an awareness of, uh, of nature and the importance of nature um, from the very beginning. How do you think that uh, have helped you from the very beginning uh, with your practice? Uh, I would say it's a continual inspiration. I would say often, you know, um, our projects don't start with the most beautiful sites. <laughs> uh, I would say that no matter what, you have to create the site. And part of that is just a lot of observation and study and thinking about how to um, in simple, subtle ways, uh, transform a site. And uh, so I feel like uh, that attuneness to um, how you can uh, make something better is really a key starting point for any project. Mm -hmm. And actually talking about starting points, uh, we have a question from the audience asking, Brigitte, what is your process of getting or winning projects? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I would say we're, I would probably call us the most reluctant architects. So, so uh, we actually don't do competitions. We don't do RFPs. We don't do RFQs. Uh, when people come to us, we kind of say, so why do you want to work with us? <laughs> and uh, we sort of really interrogate why. And if it turns out well, it's amazing and really positive. And we've had many projects where we've worked with the, for the same clients for 15 years, 20 years, for 30 years. Um, but in a way, we kind of figure we're not always the right architects for everyone. And, mm -hmm. but, but there's sometimes a fit and an alchemy that is really quite remarkable. And so it's kind of like both uh, kind of mutually testing out the waters, going on a date and seeing whether there's a kind of good fit. And if it is, it can really be catalytic and really super positive. That sounds very good. Actually, it would be nice to have Joanna with us to join also with this question. Maybe let's see what uh, she answers. Yeah. Okay, great. So that we start our roundtable discussion. Super. Johanna. Um, yes, good. hi. Uh, you um, can hear me. That's great. Uh, what is your 
way of winning projects and well, how would you answer that question? I guess we're just the opposite. Um, we do everything and anything to get a job. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a good contrast, but yeah, so we do often respond to our cues and our fees. We do competitions, we, uh, we chase clients, um, but it, in a way, I guess it's similar that there is, we do look for the right fit ultimately. And so um, when that's right, then the project is obviously better and always, uh, you know, any successful project that we've done is with the right client. Um, oftentimes it does go wrong if your values don't align, um, but um, it's not quite as selective. There's been a few key times that we've said uh, no to things that have defined us. And I didn't really talk about those, but um, early on where I think we could have gone in a different path. And uh, I have to say that a few times from the things that seem self or in a, in a way of like trying to publish work or, or um, trying to win an award or something, those do come back as, as people do hire you for the right reasons when you've had that exposure. And so I do believe in the value of, of all of that um, as a way to you, for you to find the right fit. Mm -hmm. And Brigitte, what would you recommend people who are not in the position of uh, just maybe getting clients that easily that clients come to them, uh, maybe younger practices? What would you recommend them in order to get projects? Um, I guess, you know, from the work we did at, on Toronto Modern so long ago, I think there's a kind of a whole role for architects in terms of advocacy. I think Johanna brought that up of kind of issues that you really believe in, things that really matter to you and actually going beyond just the practice to kind of be participants in that. And I feel like um, uh, we always have to be doing that to kind of really make a better society. And, uh, you know, so I think that there's both a kind of, uh, you want to build projects for sure. And I think that's one important part of what we do as architects, but you also need to shape the society that you're in to, to be able to understand the value of the things that matter to, to us as architects. So I think that's a big job and we all have to participate in it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Now that we have you, both of you together, uh, not talking about projects, is there a question that you always wanted to ask each other? A question not related to projects, maybe? I would love to ask uh, Bridget really how she, I don't know, I guess uh, you could interpret this as being, being a project question, but it's not intended that way, I guess. I'm just, whenever I'm in an event or something or same room with um, Bridget and her accomplishments are sort of listed or she's been introduced with, you know, the 12, is it 12 or is it, it's probably more by now, but I remember at one point it was 12 governor general medals and things like that. Um, you know, I'm just wondering like, what is it, like what keeps you moving forward when it feels like you've gone everything uh, when it comes to, I mean, I guess I get it, it's the next project and I always think that can be better, but is there something particularly when you're so focused in what you do that you can keep finding the inspiration again and again? I would say architecture is so endlessly fascinating as a discipline, <laughs> you know, uh, there's so many different building types, challenges. Um, I would say that, you know, climate change is like the biggest challenge we're all going to be facing and how do you actually kind of make a difference in, in all of that? Uh, I think also in Canada, it's really hard. We, we live in the second largest land mass in the world. Even if you think a building is big, it's tiny. <laughs> and, and then how do you kind of make it count or matter in some way? And I think that it's, again, for us, this kind of... Um, reading of the cross disciplinaries, art, urbanism, landscape and architecture are kind of all necessary to sort of be working together to shape a site, to make a site, to, to, as opposed to any one thing being the, the answer. Um, and so I feel like, um, you know, maybe some of those lessons from Robson Square and from Arthur and Cornelia, the kind of, the kind of uh, sense that we're actually, our, our job is more about place making than object making. And then how we actually do that is so hard. Uh, I would say getting harder with, you know, there's so many layers and requirements and um, 
but I feel like it matters in terms of, you know, uh, who we are as a society. And so if we don't try to make a difference, um, no one else is going to do it. Uh, and I just feel like it's a kind of part of a shared responsibility, I think, that all of all architects have to kind of uh, tackle. Um, and in Canada, there are actually quite few architects relative to the size of our country, right? So I think it's a even kind of slightly weightier condition. That was a nice question. Thank you, Johanna. And Brigitte, do you, may, do you have a question for her? So I was, so, so again, I said, I'm always interested in the issue of serendipity. So I was interested in how maybe your parents met because in a way these things are kind of like, uh, uh, they change, you know, you would not have been here without them meeting. So maybe that would be something that, uh, and I just appreciated hearing the kind of layers of, uh, you know, your family history that really shaped, you know, who you were, but maybe how they kind of came together as a kind of uh, couple. Well, thanks for the question. Yeah, my, um... I guess one generation back, the grandparents are from every corner of Finland. So we have uh, grandmas uh, from the north and the east and grandpas are from the west and the south. And uh, it's weird that they even got together. But um, also my parents uh, um, met at the same dancing hall or whatever you might call that, a place where young people go dancing and drinking, I guess in the uh, center of Helsinki, Botta, for if there's anybody listening from Helsinki. And I just learned that my grandparents met at the same place. Um, oh no, you know. are you serious? Yeah, oh we, uh, mom and I were chatting uh, in preparation for, for this thing. And so she told me that. So this, I, I gotta go pay homage to Botta at some point, if it's still there or the- Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these things, these chance encounters changes people's lives dramatically. And I yeah. just feel like it's such a kind of, I'm always so fascinated to kind of know how, how these kind of things actually happen. So um, thank you. So curious. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Actually, there are two regarding uh, Women's Day. Uh, if I can ask one of them uh, from Susan Steers. Um, with International Women's Day yesterday, what will you say has been the biggest challenge you both have faced as a, a woman in this industry? Hmm. Who wants to go first? That's not an easy question. Uh, maybe, uh, Bridget, as yeah. Johanna, partly yeah. kind of answer a similar question before. Yeah. So, so I would say, um, you know, raising kids and being an architect is not easy. And I would say having a partner that's an architect, having our own small practice kind of allowed us to really shape it in the way that allowed us to do what we wanted to do. So I had, you know, a kind of room that's now our archives was actually where I breastfed my kids and it became a playroom in our studio. And then it's also where my kids had sleepovers later on. And so we were able to kind of, um, you know, not have to follow any rules about you can't do this. And, and I don't think we could have done that if we had been, let's say, working in a larger corporate office. Uh, it wouldn't have really worked. It wouldn't have given us the flexibility that was really essential in being able to kind of do both. And uh, so I feel really um, very grateful that we had actually started our practice. Uh, you know, we actually... The, the week we started our practice was the same week that our first son was born. <laughs> and so we wow. were kind of making <laughs> everything up as we went along. And, uh, and but it was kind of uh, the fact that we actually, um, and I would say with not many role models for how to do that. And, uh, and uh, I just feel like we kind of just had to call it as we saw it and just make the best choices that we could. And, and kind of being able to find for us what the right balance was. So, uh, so as I said before, I, I'm not never been really good at separating work and, and uh, life. <laughs> uh, so we kind of had to find ways to co-mingle in a good way, so. And you, Johanna, you are starting that, uh, that part uh, with, the, with the kid. So it's going to be challenging, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it's more intense than I give it credit for. I, I, I know I was completely ridiculous before I sort of thought, well, you know, 
there's 15 year olds having kids. How can, how hard can it be? <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> and so I have a new found appreciation for all mothers and, and parents with, with, <laughs> with young kids today. Um, so live and learn. Um, but yeah, I, I know when, when I first started out and I guess because we work in private development, um, my biggest challenge was that there was never anybody at the other side of the table who was female. Um, still today, I've only ever once worked with one female developer today, um, like a business owner. There, there, there are people in the offices that are, are female, but not sort of the owner of the development corp. So that's, that's been a bit of a challenge. In the beginning, um, I would sort of sometimes be ignored in the, in the boardroom and um, I've had, um, and on site, you know, that's still sometimes tough. Like I've had, um, not recently, I guess maybe I found my footing, but uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, contractors walking off the site because they didn't want to take instruction from uh, a girl. Um, so that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's happened. So it's, it's yeah. But that, I'm, I'm confident that that will, it will change. Uh, that's so old fashioned and there's, there's no room for that yep. anymore. So, so sorry as a man, I'm sorry for that. It's, uh, there's oh, no... don't be sorry. This is not the, but I'm just, uh, I'm just saying that um, I guess what we can do or what, and it's unfortunate, but you kind of, I mean, I took it on myself and to be super prepared to, to go into those situations. And that's, that's how you had to, had to be at the time, but I haven't encountered lately. So I don't know if it's about this sort of, era of like maybe I got more sort of itchy as I <laughs> as I got older or, or somehow uh, I can glare at people differently now than I was able to then so uh, hopefully the, the female practitioners coming after me don't have to go through that appreciate it we hope for that uh, this is another question from the audience asking uh, what would you say are your uh, weaknesses and the greatest strength as an architect and I will go for only for the greatest strength that you think that you have as an architect. Um, Bridget, do you want to start? Because the weakness, I, we guess, will be maybe the <laughs> yeah. balance that was already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Greatest strength as an architect. Hmm. So I guess I would say, you know, um, we really try to kind of... Uh, realize what I would say are rich spatial experiences inside and out. And I kind of feel like that's something that uh, we really um, work hard at doing and we really try to kind of uh, create these rich experiences. Um, and this kind of the boundary between inside and outside for us is sort of something we like to continually manipulate and adjust and alter. So it's a kind of uh, and especially in our climatic zone, it makes it a bit challenging, but it's something we love to kind of play with and uh, experiment with. So, um, um. and Johanna, what will you, how will you, will you answer to that question? I was, I was trying to decide between, uh, mm, on one hand, being very um, direct and always looking for like what's there to, that needs to be shaven off um, in a sense that projects become more robust if they don't have any frivolous parts is how I feel. And it's always been like that. Um, so I guess I can cut to that um, fairly naturally. And the second part is I think I'm actually very sensitive and one is supposed to not say that, but um, so I think that allows me sometimes to really at this conceptual stage, really tap into some of those things that um, that really feel right or try to sort of get to that place. So yeah, somewhere there. It's so interesting. Um, I see another question coming in. Um, so the audience can send out the questions using the box on our website. Um, there's another question, thanking you for the nice lectures and uh, asking, what can we do or what should we do more of as the over overrepresented voices uh, as what what can we do as the overrepresented voice to help support and advocate for those who are underrepresented in the in the profession um i would say we all have a again a role to play in um 
So first of all, many people that are underrepresented don't even know what architecture school or landscape architecture school is. How we actually bring them into the design disciplines is actually, a, I think, the hardest job. <laughs> and then once they're there to kind of retain them and to kind of uh, provide a nurturing environment for them to do really great work. Um, so it's kind of a few steps along the way that are necessary for that to happen. I think that things are changing, but, you know, maybe a bit slower than we would like. And there's something about the, like I had this experience um, last time around when I was teaching um, in Chicago, I had a student who was not doing terribly well in the studio. And then um, we learned afterwards that um, the year before, or she was homeless um and i just sort of i i just couldn't imagine how you would maintain uh a school life in in that situation it's a sort of i do think that there is an extra care and duty to um to the, those underrepresented that you know there's extra help we had to somehow bridge the gap uh like i said in my presentation i think the starting line is just not even and i'm so privileged in having grown up the way that I have and um, and so are others and it, we, we don't focus in on that often enough that we need these bridges before people can really be equal um, and so it's our duty that whomever are, are in that privileged position to to help the other the other side yeah yeah I agree with that um, both of you have so such a it's very interesting, extending um, backgrounds. Both of you are immigrants in a very young country, a very different also stories at the same time. Um, how do you think having that uh, international upbringing have, uh, has made you uh, in some way a better architect? Well, hopefully the perspective from different places and different folks in, in situations that they're, they're in, I mean, something about knowing that in sort of really internally knowing and uh, internalizing it that um, that you know the the priorities are different um, and that you know we are supposed to be building the world for everybody and so having seen it from variety of whether it's cultural or or social group or economic backgrounds I think it's vital for us to be able to understand how we can act in the in the benefit of, of all mm -hmm. i would say Bridget. canada is a very young country and i would say johan and i share the fact that we came from somewhere else which kind of makes us canadian uh, uh, and uh, other than you know first nations who have been here for thousands of years uh, everyone else is kind of a newcomer in some way um, i would say that uh, i would say it gives you a certain uh, level of empathy a uh, kind of uh, there's a humanness to kind of having to leave one life and start a new life. Uh, and, you know, as we're seeing with all of the things happening in Ukraine, people having to pick up and move, you know, and leave their homes and their kind of uh, their, their neighborhoods, their communities, it's very hard. Uh, we didn't have to do it under like a duress situation, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it requires a kind of a level of courage to do that at a certain point in your life. And I feel like the kind of um, the sort of empathy for other people who come from different places and understanding the challenge of how difficult that is, I think is kind of, uh, you know, really important for all of us to be kind of aware of that. And, um, and I think the world, you know, I think is becoming more, uh, I think there's always been a diaspora, but I think it's even more there's even more layers and more complexity to it. So I think it's a really human condition that we all are having to face globally. I think, you know, whether we live in Canada or anywhere else in the world. So it's something that um, really, I think shapes people's lives in really meaningful and really profound ways. And uh, so I think uh, how we reflect on it, how I would say literature has been really interesting as being able to describe those things um, in in uh, in really poignant and meaningful ways. There's amazing Canadian literature from people from all over the world who have come here, and their stories are remarkable. And I, I'm always impressed by them. 
Maybe one last question, um, and that will be regarding Canada. Uh, for the for the architects who have never visited, um, who have never been to Canada, what do you think they should not miss when visiting the country, and what do you think they will love about Can Canadian architecture? They should definitely yeah. not miss Winnipeg. Um, <laughs> We're a weird place and uh, they should definitely come in January. Uh, there it is, um, it gets uh, below minus, well, minus 40 or somewhere around there at its worst, <laughs> but at its best also because it is so um, spectacularly unusual in the world these days, especially with global warming. And we still manage to be outside and, and there's a, there's warming huts uh, competition on the frozen river. There's you know 12 kilometers scaling trails. So so people know how to how to be uh, and take advantage of the of the winter. And yeah, so don't miss Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Don't miss Manitoba. <laughs> uh, so I would say you know 85% of Canadians live within an hour's drive of the U.S. border. So when you think of how huge the country is, there's a kind of little band of population. Um, maybe about five or six years ago, we actually took our first trip to the Canadian Arctic. We were in a place called Bathurst Inlet, which is about the middle of the kind of, uh, of uh, the Arctic Ocean. And it was so amazing. I had never been anywhere where there was such a subtlety in being able to, having to read the landscape. And at first you think there's nothing here, a bit like when you first arrive in the prairies, it doesn't look like there's much there. And then your eyes actually recalibrate and you see so much and it's so spectacular. Uh, we were there uh, in the summer, which is kind of one time of the year, but there were the kind of uh, the things we saw and how we had to kind of really work at seeing, but once we could see what, you know, things, um, it was just a whole other world. So I just feel like for me, that was such a revelation. And I think it would be, it's such a special, special and fragile landscape. So um, and what do you mean by seeing mm, all the things? What kind of things uh, when so, you refocus uh, as you were saying? So at first you just think there's a bunch of rocks that are on the, on the ground. But if you look closely, you can see that they're actually markers for caribou. Uh, some of them are tent uh, uh, circles that describe settlements where people had stayed or slept before or so things that you just at first you don't really get it and, and you have to really look carefully and when you start to see the landscape it changes everything and it's just it's so subtle but so powerful and really really impressive uh, it's uh it requires work just to look at it, but I just think it's so, so worthwhile. That sounds very nice. So um, thank you a lot for the whole conversation, for the beautiful presentations. We really enjoyed it and we virtually traveled to Canada. Hopefully we can travel to Canada soon uh, in person, so not virtually. Um, it has been such an, uh, an honor for us to have you both participating and uh, to have the opportunity to, to get to know you. Um, we uh, would love to meet you in person as, uh, and also that you enjoy the audience that we are, are, that the audience is watching now so that you can enjoy the atmosphere. Maybe at some point we can do that together, that there is a, 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 there is a participation where you have the audience in front of you. But we really... Um, we're really thankful, thankful for your participation and thanks also to, to the audience for being there, also to our partner Vector Worlds for this event. And uh, it has been a, a pleasure for us. And we are kind of sad that it's over because it takes so many months thinking about uh, this event and thinking of you, what could we ask and uh, review and have you, what you have done. And it's so interesting to, uh, to be in touch with you that uh, we are going to miss... Uh, to miss this uh, and hopefully we can we can meet soon great thank, thank you, you so Sarah. much yes thank you thank you a lot yeah thank, thank you. you thank you for the person for the participation bye bye